Good evening, church. It's great to see you here on the Midweek Bible Study. If you're at home watching on live, so glad that you are there and joining us. Or if you're watching this later on the recording, uh, glad that you're, you're doing that as we study through the book of Romans. So tonight we're in chapter 9, so you can go ahead and find that. And we've got some just wonderful stuff. Chapter 9. Just as we told you last week that chapter 8 was one of the most wonderful chapters in the whole Bible, really. Chapter 9 then takes us into one of the more difficult <laughs> chapters of the whole Bible. Uh, and you'll soon see why. But I think God's got some really good, good things for us to see here tonight. So let's pray and then we'll get right into it. Father, thank you for the day that you have blessed us with, Lord. We thank you whether it's been a relaxing day or, or a busy day or a hairy day. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the time now to, to, to be still and to read your word together, uh, to say some words about it. And we pray that those words are faithful. Uh, we pray that they give light and understanding. But Lord, most of all, you, you have to do that in our minds and hearts by your spirit as you apply your word. So Lord, may, uh, may we be open to receive in your word tonight. And Lord, may you help us, especially as we look at this chapter, um, give us a deeper appreciation uh, for sovereignty, for your sovereignty in the gospel, in our lives, truly in the affairs of, of the world, of everything. And Lord, help us to <clears throat> wrestle with this mystery, but may we come away from it uh, with a deep sense of gratitude and humility for the, what you have done in every believer's life. Lord, we love you. We ask you to take this time and, and make it valuable to us, honoring to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me find my clicker, which I left down here on the table. And first of all, let's review really quickly because I think this is important so we keep uh, keep reminding ourselves of how this is developing and how God using Paul is developing this wonderful presentation of the gospel and helping us understand it so <clears throat> quickly in chapter one we saw uh, Paul write about the God's wrath and how it rests on non-Jewish people people without the law uh, but they have no excuse because uh, they know there's a creator and they have this moral sense in them. It's instinctive. In chapter two, he said, God is going to judge all people by their works. God is completely fair. He's going to judge people according, or will judge them for their sin. He will also reward them uh, for their righteousness. He'll show no partiality. In chapter three, though, we learn that no person is sinless and God is glorified for his justice and his grace. And there is where we learned about justification and understanding what that means. It means I have a right standing before God if I'm in Christ because he has been substituted for me. Chapter four, we uh, see Abraham was talked about there and David as well. And uh, we learn that Abraham's righteousness uh, was also by faith. Uh, Paul's saying this proves that it's always been by faith, even before Jesus. Chapter 5, then he goes on and, and develops this parallel and this contrast between Adam and Jesus. Through Adam, all have been corrupted. Through Jesus, all who believe have been restored and reconciled to God. So we often refer to Jesus as the second Adam. Chapter 6, um, pretty simple. The believer cannot continue to pursue sin because he's no longer a slave to sin. In other words, he's been, he's been freed. His, his ability, his desire has been changed miraculously by God himself. So now what he didn't want, he now wants. Uh, what he used to pursue, now he doesn't want to pursue. Now we learned in chapter seven though, there's still a struggle. Uh, it goes on. Um, Paul used himself as an example of this. And the law is actually good because it shows us that we're sinners. Uh, we learn that our condition is one of, of total depravity in the sense that we there's not any of us, not, not any part of us that naturally seeks after God, but God 
finds us and he does the change in us um, and we're rescued uh, from such a hopeless and wretched state, Paul told us, uh, because we can't do it on our own. God has to do it for us. And then last time in chapter 8, we learn that the Christian has this unshakable hope because what of God has done, Uh, not because of what we do. And that was the big idea because of what God has done. He saves us. He's the one with us. He's the one that keeps us by his presence and his power. Uh, So we we learned that last time. And at the last time, in the end of chapter 8, we were introduced to this idea of God's foreknowledge, of God's predestining us, meaning that he knows ahead of time, that he's determined ahead of time that we would be conformed to the image of his son, that he would justify us, that he would glorify us. We, we learned all of that at the end. And now Paul's gonna, he's going to take that idea and continue it in the chapter nine. Now, in chapter nine, here's what it's gonna unpack. It's gonna unpack the truth of God's sovereignty in the gospel. This is the big idea, you might say, which ultimately is the cause of who is saved and who is not. So just pause for a minute, kind of get your mind around that idea that that's the big thought in this chapter. Now there's other stuff going on in context and we're gonna see that, but that's the big idea. Just getting our minds around this idea that even in my salvation, even every person, whether they're saved or lost throughout all of history and into the future, until Jesus comes and all this comes to a close, all of it's wrapped up in the sovereignty of God. All of it. it, it it's according to his sovereign will. And you're going to see specifically how, how Paul's going to explain this. Okay? I'm going to give you a quote, and it's a long one. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can read all that. This is from Charles Spurgeon. Because we're going to get into this subject. He was such a wordsmith. He just had a way of saying something that you go, I wish I could say it like that. But, but he's talking to this divine mystery. And listen to what he says, because he's talking about this idea of predestination and God's sovereignty. He says, do not imagine for an instant that I pretend to be able to thoroughly to elucidate the great mysteries of predestination. There are some men who claim to know all about the matter. They twist it around their fingers as easily as if it were an everyday thing. But depend upon it, he who thinks he knows all about this mystery knows very little. It is but the shallowness of his mind that permits him to see the bottom of his knowledge. Isn't that great? Um, He who dives deep finds that there is in the lowest depth to which he can attain a deeper depth still. The fact is, the great questions about a man's responsibility, free will, and predestination have been fought over and over and over again and have been answered in 10,000 different ways. And the result has been that we know just as much about the matter as when we first began. The combatants have thrown dust into each other's eyes and have hindered each other from seeing. And they have concluded that because they put other people's eyes out, they could therefore see. So there'll be no dust throwing tonight in our eyes. You will leave here. If you've never taken a deep dive into this subject, you're gonna leave disturbed, kind of a little confused, pondering about this mystery. And Spurgeon says, that's probably right where you need to be because he really can't in the end comprehend Uh, the the depths of God's sovereignty and will throughout eternity, much less just in our short lives on this earth. So so you approach it with humility. You approach it with open-mindedness and to see what it's supposed to produce in us. And I will tell you this, it's not to produce arrogance in anybody. It is to completely humble us before God when we think about these great doctrines and mysteries of of grace. So the larger context here, we we need to say a word about that because chapter nine fits into kind of a section in this letter that's really three chapters long, nine, 10, and 11. Because what 
Paul's doing in these three chapters is he's addressing the issue of the Jews. What about them? What about Israel? Because so much of Israel, the majority of Jews have rejected Christ. So the big question is, has God forsaken them? What's going to happen? So remember that context through these three chapters. That's, that's behind it all and what Paul's trying to deal with. He's writing probably primarily to a Gentile audience, probably a mixture though because Jews were scattered everywhere, but they're probably predominantly Gentile. And remember, Romans is all about too how God has brought the Gentiles in. And we're going to see that in this chapter, but it still begs the question, what about the promises to Israel? And he's going to get into that. So you can look forward to that. So let's finally get to the text, Romans 9. Let's read the first five verses and get started here. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit. So he's getting ready to say something really personal, really intense. And he's just stressing that. Verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race according to the flesh is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So you see Paul sets the context for these three chapters. His heart is breaking. It almost reminds you when Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem. It's almost as Paul is weeping here over his people. His heart is, is breaking for them. So you see, he begins this section by voicing this deep sorrow for his fellow Jews. This is who he is. These are his people. And, and his heart's breaking for them because of their, their unbelief. The fact is the overwhelming majority of them did not have faith in Jesus as the Savior. They had rejected him. And he says this is sad because he recounts this list of things, historical and theological, the items in which Israel uh, was key in God's plan of redemption. Did you catch those? Look at those again in verses 4 and 5. What belongs to them, adoption, glory, the covenants, giving of the law, the worship at the tabernacle in the temple, promises all the way back to Abraham, the patriarchs, all those stories, and ultimately the Christ himself. So he recounts all of these things that God did in Israel and through Israel. The, the people, um, but yet there's this, this sadness. And so the looming question is the status of the promise made to Israel. What happened? What happened? God had been working from the very beginning to bring Jesus, the Christ, to be their savior, to be their Lord, to be their king, and they've overwhelmingly rejected him. So what is going to happen? So what Paul's going to go into is he's going to go into what has, he's going to go into this section where he's going to say something unexpected has happened, but yet it doesn't impugn God at all. God is still true to his promises. So look in verse uh, 6 and let's read down through verse 13. So he starts with the conjunction of contrast, but... It is not as though the word of God has failed. Okay, so he said Israel's rejected Christ and they had all this stuff, but the word of God has not failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. 
And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. All right. So what's Paul, Paul doing here? The best way I know how to word this is Paul is loosening to some degree the understanding of God's promise of a people from the confines of a physical, ethnic reality, Jewish people. And he's broadened it to a spiritual reality that's anchored in faith, which shouldn't surprise us. He's been talking and hammering this idea. It's by faith. You know, it's by faith that one is justified. It's all about faith. So now he's, he's bringing in this discussion of Israel. What about the nation? What about the people of Israel that's descended from Abraham? What about all these people who seem to be on the outside now? What's going on? And so he's going to say that that's not the right way to think about it in these physical, fleshly kind of ways. So he makes a couple of really important points here. He says not every individual biologically descended from Abraham is Israel. And you think about Ishmael. Ishmael was literally Abraham's son, but he was never one involved with the promise. You think about the example he gives here, Esau, born to Isaac, but never, even from the womb, was going to be one who inherited the promise. It would be Jacob. So he's making this point. He's saying there is ample testimony from the stories before Jesus, from the patriarchs, that not everyone who was born literally in the line of Abraham was going to be a recipient of the promise. Of course, he's going to beg the question, why? And we'll get to that. And he also makes this point. Israel is not only those biologically descended from Abraham. And of course, he's got in mind there the Gentiles. So there are others who've received the promise who physically, biologically aren't connected to Abraham at all. And of course, this gets developed more as the letter goes on. Um, so you see what Paul's doing. He, he's saying, if we're thinking like, oh, God has broke his promise to Israel and now all these Jews have missed it. What he's saying, he's redirecting our minds and saying, you're thinking about it in the wrong way. That's never been the case even from the beginning because there's plenty of, of examples. And what he does say in there, he says, it's about being children of the promise, not children of Abraham. Are you a child of the promise that God was giving and what he's been working out? And then he says that recipients of the promise are determined by God's choosing, not by a birthright. And this is the big idea here. Back to what I said at the beginning, this sovereignty of God in the gospel. And he quotes from the prophet Malachi, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, when he talks about Jacob and Esau as an example of this. So here, here's the scripture from, from Malachi. Uh, the prophet, you know, the Lord is speaking through the prophet. This is the very beginning of, of that uh, book. It says, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Okay, so this is, this is kind of the formula in Malachi's prophecy that he uses. The, uh, God says something and they kind of give a smart aleck response. <laughs> God says, I love you. And the people say, oh yeah, how do you, you loved us? It don't feel like you've loved us. And this is what the Lord says. It says, uh, but you say, how have you loved us? And the Lord says, is not Esau Jacob's brother? Of course, the answer is yes, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. 
I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. So in the context of Malachi, what the Lord is saying to Israel is you're doubting my love because the people at that time were experiencing a lot of difficulty and suffering and they were complaining, you know, like us. And God says, you know, I love you. And they're like, how? He says, well, don't you remember? I, I chose Jacob. I chose your patriarch where you've come from. And I rejected Esau. That should tell you, I love you. You're my people. So Paul uses that from Malachi to make his point here in Romans. He's saying God has chosen. Esau was a descendant of Abraham, literally, but it didn't make him an inheritor of the promise. Okay, so that's his point. So he's saying it's not about biology. It's not about who you descended from. It's not about birthright. It's about did God choose you? to be part of that promise. All right. Let's go on to verse 14 through 18. And he gives more examples of this thought. He says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. All right, we'll stop right there. So Paul does what we've seen him doing, right? He anticipates a question. He anticipates opposition um, to what he's just said. And, and he knows that now his reader's going to be thinking, doesn't this make God partial and unjust? Because Paul, what you just said was God chooses who's going to be part of the promise. And we think about Ishmael, poor fellow. He, he doesn't seem like he did anything wrong but yet he's on the outside. You think about Esau and it just said even before they were born, God chose Jacob over Esau. God loved Jacob and hated Esau. It doesn't seem fair. So you see where he's anticipating this. You're thinking the same thing, right? Right? So Paul anticipates your question too, <laughs> you know, or you might just say God anticipates that question. You know, does this make God partial or unjust because that's how it feels to us and what was his answer we've gotten used to this by no means by no means so Paul likes putting that question out there knowing what you're thinking and then tell you no 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 don't go there that's not the right way to think about this so Paul to give more evidence for what he's saying he, he gives more examples from the Old Testament what we call the Old Testament. He goes back to Exodus and, and gives some examples to prove that God's sovereignty in this way is not a new concept. Okay, don't miss this. He's saying this has been there. You've already read about this. You should know this about God if you're familiar with what we call the Old Testament stories, the scriptures. And so he gives some examples. Um, he goes to Exodus 33, and he references this with um, Pharaoh. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name the Lord and I will be gracious, and, and this is what God's going to do with Pharaoh. I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I'll show mercy. So again, Paul is quoting from that exchange between the Lord and Moses, emphasizing again, it's God's choosing. God will be merciful. He will be gracious to those whom he chooses to show that to. And then we get an, 
kind of a negative example that you might say. Exodus chapter 9. For by now I could have put my hand and struck you, and he's talking to Pharaoh, and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up. And here's the purpose. To show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. In other words, the Lord was saying through Moses to Pharaoh, the, the reason you're the way you are <laughs> is because I'm going to use you to show the world who I am is what God's doing. Pharaoh is a tool in God's hands to display his own glory. And then you got this other one that's referenced from Exodus 10.1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go in to Pharaoh, go talk to him, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I may show these signs of mine among them. So Paul gives these examples from Pharaoh, from what the Lord said to Moses, that God works his sovereign will. He, he works in the way he chooses to work. And he can sh show mercy and be gracious to whom he wants to do that to. He can also take someone like Pharaoh and harden his heart for his own purpose. To show his glory and his power. All right, y'all tracking Paul so far? It's really not hard to understand. It's hard to accept. Isn't it? And, right? I mean, that's for me too. It's, it's just, wow, really? This, is, this seems really hard and it, and it cuts against kind of way we normally think about things. But if you go on to chapter, or I should say verse 19, um, he, he continues. So look at verse 19 through 24. You will say to me then, <laughs> why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, old man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. And there it is, the Gentiles. I told you they would come in there eventually. So again, Paul anticipates another objection to what he just said there. How can God find fault with one who he hardens or he doesn't choose to be part of the promise? Isn't that the natural next question? You say, well, who's going to be saved? Well, those who are part of God's promise. Well, who are, who, who's included in the promise? The ones who God chooses. Well, that doesn't seem fair to the people who are on the outside looking in. What kind of chance do they have if that's how it really ultimately works? If God is truly sovereign in salvation of all individuals, then how is that fair? Is that the question in your mind? Absolutely. Uh, it, of course it is. It's a question in mind too. How is that fair? And Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knows that's the objection everybody has at this point. How, how can that be fair? What did he say? He said, <laughs> In verse 19, you will say to me, how does he still find fault? In other words, how can you blame someone if God simply didn't choose them, if he didn't draw them, if he didn't call them and save them like he's been describing? Or even if he went as far like in Pharaoh to actually harden his heart for his own purposes. Well, how can you, how can you blame Pharaoh if God did that to him? I think it's an honest question natural question and look at what Paul said I'm going to tell you it's not very satisfying answer but it's the biblical answer and that's what we got to see it isn't our job to to try to take God's word and and mold it to our comfort level 
And it's our job to let it mold us until we get comfortable with what God has said. It can take a while <laughs> because some of these ideas are hard. But notice what he said. He answers this objection by going back to the fact that God is creator. Okay, so, so he's, he's anchoring, he's rooting God's sovereignty in the gospel to the fact that God is the creator. And guess what? None of us are. It's good to be reminded of that occasionally. He's God. He's the Almighty. He's the Creator. He's the one that made everything out of nothing, including us. We're the creatures. And so you've got to understand that this, you might think, a hard doctrine of God's sovereignty, His choosing in the big picture, it makes sense. It's rooted in who He is. If He's the Creator, and he's all those things that we always say he is. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Does this not make sense? That at the end of the day, when you step back and look at the whole picture, that God is certainly in control of it all. Why? Because it all belongs to him. And what we forget is everybody belongs to him. It doesn't matter if you believe or not. You still belong to him. And that's just the truth. That's just the fact. And so he says here in an illustration, he uses this illustration of the potter to highlight God's sovereignty as creator. He says at this point, I know you, you, know, you have this objection, but he says your objection is absurd. Use your imagination with me. It's as absurd as a potter. You've seen potters and they have their clay and on the wheel as if the clay could talk to the potter and say, why are you making me like this? He says, the question, your objection, is that absurd? The, the, the clay can't answer back to the potter. You know, why did you make me a cup and not a bowl? You know, why did you make me a vase and not a cup? You know, or why did you make me an ashtray? You know, whatever. And he says, can't the potter make some vessels you know, for common use and some for good use. I mean, and then he says a very interesting thing there at the end. He says, even though all are vessels of wrath, using that image of the pottery, you know, a vessel, God's patiently brought about mercy for some to the praise of his grace and for his own glory. And it's both Jews and Gentiles. Read, read that again. I can't paraphrase any better than I can read it again. Verse 22, what if God desire, and, and he doesn't mean it's in question. He's just saying, consider this. What if God desiring to show his wrath, uh, get that, get your mind around that, desiring to show his wrath, to make known his power, his justice, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath, sinful humanity who rebel against him and deny the truth and suppress it. Prepared for destruction, that's their destiny. But he's done that in order, the reason, reason he's been patient, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. So part of what Paul's saying here, again, I said it, it doesn't satisfy very much because he gets to this objection and he just says, you can't ask that question. <laughs> it, it's not an appropriate question because you're questioning your creator who owns everything and can do as he will. Verse 20, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? And he isn't just saying, you know, who are you as an individual? He's saying, who are you, old man? Who are you formed out of the dust of the earth? Who are you, humanity, creature, to question God? It's a rhetorical question, but I think we know the answer, don't we? You can't. It isn't your place. Now, that's the rub, isn't it? That's what's really hard for us to accept, <laughs> 
because we naturally want an answer. We naturally think we deserve an answer. We, we naturally think we deserve an explanation that will satisfy our little pea brains compared to our creator. And that, that's kind of laughable if you think about it. We, we, we can't grasp that. And that's what Paul's trying to say here. Now, look at verses 25. Let's go on. He's going to bring in some of um, prophets as well here. Verse 25, as indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, Gentiles, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said of them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, he would have, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. In other words, completely destroyed. So Paul quotes Hosea. He quotes Isaiah here again to bring context of what he's talking about. So from Hosea, he demonstrates that God had already said his people would include the Gentiles. Again, not everyone who's descended from Abraham is truly Israel. There are going to be these Gentiles. Aren't you glad about that? Because that's us. <laughs> and that's a good thing. Now from Isaiah, he shows that God has always said that not all Jews would be saved, but that a remnant would be preserved. They wouldn't become like Sodom and Gomorrah. They wouldn't be completely destroyed. There would remain a remnant. And he's going to deal more with that as we get through these three chapters. And that's important. Because Paul is both saying that true Israel is not necessarily all Jews. It also includes non-Jews. But at the same time, God hasn't gone back on his promises. Israel still is chosen people. And there's something more to play out. So he, he's, he's going to be saying both of these things. And then the end here, verse 30 through 33. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I'm laying a, in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him, as Jesus, will not be put to shame. And again, that's a quote from Isaiah. So in these closing verses in this chapter, Paul returns to the contrast of true salvation by faith versus a false understanding of trying to earn salvation by keeping the law. So he's kind of brought us back to that idea. The Gentiles have come in by faith. They didn't even have the law. They didn't need the law. They came in by faith when they heard the message when they heard the gospel while many Jews continued in trying to, to perform for God and keep the law and have this works-based idea of salvation, which is futile. We've already learned that. And so Paul's kind of brought us back around to that idea. Gentiles have been able to be included by receiving a righteousness that comes by faith. And when you do that, you've, you have fulfilled the demands of the law. You've fulfilled the demands of the law in Christ himself because he's fulfilled it. Many Jews have been excluded because they pursued God through their own ability to keep the law, which cannot fulfill the demand of the law without Christ. That's what he says here at the end. And Jesus has fulfilled prophecy by becoming the savior of stumbling and offense, just like Isaiah said would happen. He came to his own people and his own people didn't receive him. 
uh, he's echoing that idea that that's exactly what did happen. He's going to keep talking about that because that's very, you can tell, remember how Paul began the chapter, it's very near to his heart. These are his people and he's very concerned about them. So let me give you some takeaways and then we'll have a minute or two for some questions. You might have a couple. Takeaways. One thing we learn here is God has not reneged on his promise to Israel. Paul's making that very clear. If you're thinking that for a second, you can't think that. We've maybe, the Jews misunderstood what God was going to do in Messiah, and they've missed the boat, so to speak, a lot of them. But it doesn't mean that God has gone back on his promise. Second takeaway is being part of God's people or Israel is determined by God's promise, not ethnicity. Other places in scripture, it says we are spiritual Israel. We're grafted in, so to speak, into Israel. Isn't that interesting? So we're not Jews. We're not literally Israel in a biological, physical sense, but we are part of the promise. So you might put Israel in quotes. Yes, Paul is sort of spiritualizing Israel a little bit here. Uh, he, he's using a little bit of a def def definition, but, but you understand what he's saying. All the people God's going to save are not just going to be, be Jews. As creator, God has true divine sovereignty over humanity. And I hope you heard that in there. That's an important point, an important takeaway from this chapter. God is creator. In the beginning, God created. It's one of the most profound starting points for our faith. In the beginning, God. Not us. <laughs> And certainly not our individualism, but, but we belong to him. Whether we want to recognize it or not, we do. And that is where his sovereignty is, is grounded. And lastly, one more, I'd just put it this way. In the broader context of one's personal salvation, uh, there is the, the sovereign choice of God that's involved. Now, I don't expect us to understand exactly how that works. <laughs> but I want you to understand this is what this is teaching. Is that when you step back and you look at any of our lives that are in Christ, what God's word ultimately leads us to understand is that we didn't save ourselves. God, God did it from beginning to end like we, were, we learned last week too. And this is not to lead to an arrogance like, hey, I know I'm in, but, you know, I think you're out. <laughs> you know, we, we don't have those eyes. That, that, that would be a complete misapplication and understanding of what God's teaching us here about his sovereignty. Whenever we run into these really strong teachings about God's sovereignty, even his choice in the fact that you're sitting here today because God in his sovereignty had a plan for you to be drawn to him and be saved, Wow, that, that should evoke such humility and awe of what God has done for you who did not deserve it. You, you don't deserve it any more than anybody else deserves it. You, what actually, those who receive mercy from God are folks who deserved his wrath like everybody else. But he chose to save them. And it's a mystery. I remember Spurgeon, I quoted Spurgeon earlier one of his well-known short quotes is when someone asked him about, how do you reconcile, Mr. Spurgeon, God's sovereignty with, with human responsibility? You know, in Scripture, it says, you know, whosoever will, and you have to repent and believe. But here God says, I, have to, I choose you. He said, how do you reconcile? And Spurgeon said, I don't try to reconcile friends. In other words, they're... They're not in opposition. It may be a paradox. It may twist our brains up in a knot, but it isn't contradictory. I like to look at it this way. Um, when I made my commitment to follow Jesus, I was almost 11 years old. And I'd been going to church and hearing the gospel and had a great interest in it. It was becoming just a consuming interest, even as a child. 
and I begin to understand about God's wrath. I begin to understand about what Jesus actually did for me, and I began to, I thought, I began to connect the dots. You know, that Jesus died for me, and I needed to follow him and believe in him, or I would go to hell. And I was a little scared going to hell. It's kind of a natural thing because I really believed what I was learning, that that's a real place, and you, you need Jesus. And so I still remember the day in the church. Nobody knew what was going on but me, and I hadn't talked to anybody about it. I had just been mulling over this stuff, and, and I just remember going forward at a church service and telling the preacher simply, I just need to be saved. I know I do, and, um, and that's all I could say. And he was very gracious. He counseled me. He made sure I understood, but I know somewhere in there, God changed my heart and I had a desire for him, whereas before I didn't. Now, I made a choice to follow Jesus. There was a call to follow Jesus. There was a call to repent. There was a call to follow him. And from where I was sitting, I chose to do that. But years later, and I'm studying God's word and I'm reading places like Romans 9 or Ephesians 1, and I'm going, there's a whole lot more going on than I understood when I was 11 years old. <laughs> there was a whole lot more going on. Why did I even want God? Why was I even interested? I had friends, they weren't interested in it. Why was I sitting on the front row of the church just intently listening to the preacher at a young age? Why? why? I know why. Because God chose me. God foreknew, God predestined, God called, God justified, God is glorified. He did all of that. Now, here's, here's the mystery. I don't think that takes away from what I did and how I responded. I don't think it takes away from it at all. I don't think it makes me into a robot or anything like that. I think it's just really a divine mystery of how that works. Spurgeon also said, that he believed completely in these doctrines of grace. He completely do. He said, but it's not like you can go around and tell who's who. So just preach the gospel to everybody. <laughs> God knows who will be saved and who won't. It's not our knowledge to know that. That's not our concern. That's God's, that is in God's purview, his sovereignty. Our job as a church is just to share the gospel with everyone because we know he's going to save some don't we? He said he will. And so that's our responsibility. So I don't know. You probably go home tonight and you're like, what? <laughs> and let me tell you, but if that's where you are, you're in a good place. It's okay. Just don't close the door on it. Keep the door open and keep digging and keep studying because I believe with all my heart, I didn't misrepresent anything that we read. Okay, so it's not me. We read God's word. And again, our goal is to be conformed to his word, conformed to Christ, not impose our will on his word. Even if it stretches us, even if it makes us uncomfortable, that's okay. It's right where God wants us to be. I mean, how silly would it be if we think we could actually figure God out? Right? All right. Any questions before we dismiss? Yes, ma'am. And thank you for being here. Yeah. The first. If I have to choose between those two, and I don't know if everybody's familiar with those terms, but nobody in this room is an Arminian. Honestly, because everyone in here, none of, do any of you believe that you can be saved tonight and lost tomorrow? Well, then you're not an Arminian. Yeah. A strict Arminian would, would believe you could lose your salvation. A free will Baptist. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but Calvinist, yeah, I, Reformed, uh, probably lean that direction. I don't really like the C word. It, it, gets a little, it gets a little crazy when you use that word because, you know, it just does. But, but if you give me that choice, if that's my only choices, yeah. And I would say Baptist are certainly more influenced by the Reformed tradition, Calvinism, than they are Arminianism, except Free Will Baptist and some other groups. Good question. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it is, but I get it. I understand. Um, yeah, the reason Paul uses that example was for that very reason. Before those children had done anything, good or bad. And his, his emphasis was saying, it isn't about our works. And that was his, that's the point. It's not about anything you do, because look at these two guys. God had already determined stuff before they were even born. So... He foreknew them, sure. Keep wrestling, keep wrestling. These are all the things that are so good to, to think about and just keep reading and digging um, because it is, yeah, our God is amazing. And, I, and that's what you have to take away from this, how humbling it is, how amazing, how rich, how deep these things are. Not to be discouraged, but, but to be humbled in the presence of our sovereign God. We, we typically don't have a problem with God being sovereign in the affairs of the world and all these kinds of things. But then when it comes down to personal salvation, we get a little uncomfortable with him being sovereign there. We feel like we need to do something in the deal, so to speak. And I don't think scripture teaches that. Um, but anyway, just keep digging. It's, it, we got more of it to go. So um, it's, it's a wonderful book. So um, the book of Romans and leaves you with lots of questions and things to continue to study and to ponder and to pray over. One more question, if anybody's got one, then we got to go. Yeah. He did. Yeah. I would go, you know, if you want to read some complimentary just from Scripture, go to the first couple chapters of Ephesians and read that and see how that lines up with what we read tonight. And, and actually, you'll start seeing it all over the Bible. I mean, Paul gave examples from the Old Testament. I mean, you'll begin to see God's sovereignty everywhere. You really will. And again, it's not a bad thing. I think it's a very good thing. Um, it gives us the right perspective biblically, I believe. All right. That's what? It is because, as we mentioned in the last chapter, um, it doesn't depend on us to keep our salvation because we wouldn't have the power to do it if it depended on us. It didn't depend on us to get ourselves saved. It doesn't depend on us to keep ourselves saved. God does all of that from beginning to end. And that is very comforting. It's very assuring, even in the hardest of times, or even when we slip and fall, even when we mess up we know God still has us because who can, can, can wrestle us away from the love of God in Christ? And he said, nothing. And that's wonderful, isn't it? So yeah, we'll just stay, we'll just end with that. All right. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, just the time to, to be here and to look into your word, Lord, how humbling it is as our minds attempt to grasp, uh, as Spurgeon said, with, with, <laughs> with this human responsibility, but yet the clear teachings of your divine sovereignty and all these things. And Lord, our, our desire is not to throw dust in each other's eyes over these things, but to be humble and to approach it with reverence and just seek to have understanding. Lord, that's, that's what we desire. Just continue to teach us in your word and, um, and conform our minds to it. Lord, we thank you for the assurance that we have in you. And Lord, we thank you for this wonderful message of the gospel you give us. And Father, let us share it liberally, freely with other people as you give us the opportunity to do so. Lord, thank you uh, for everyone here tonight and uh, bless us as we depart here this evening. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.